I'd like to introduce uh, our next uh, session. Do we have a title for this? Just states. Nope. <laughs> there we go. Well, there it is. It's the 911 31177 connection. And uh, we'll welcome back our uh, two presenters, Annie Michon, Michon uh, from uh, UK, uh, who's uh, already given a couple of presentations this week and was our keynote speaker uh, just a little while ago. And then Ian Crane, who's uh, heavily involved in the uh, UK 911 Truth Movement. Uh, and he's going to give us the PowerPoint presentation, but let's uh, have the uh, beginning of the session with Annie Michon. Please welcome Annie Michon. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back on a stage. I'm getting quite used to this now. It's great fun. Um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time this afternoon because I know Ian's got uh, a lot of detail around all three of those attacks, which show um, a lot of mirror imaging uh, going on between them. Um, I really just want to reiterate a few things that I said last night. Um, start off by making the point that we are always tarred with the brush of being conspiracy theorists. Now, I'm sorry, I've worked on the inside. I've seen a number of these things going on. This is not a theory. This is fact. And the sooner that more people wake up to this, the better, because we can start affecting some serious change. Um, the things I just want to run over very briefly in terms of what we saw, I want to re-mention the Gaddafi plot. Now, this is the reason, as I said last night, that David and I went public, why we blew the whistle on MI5 and MI6. Um, it's also, I think, why they've gone after us, or well, certainly after David, quite so stringently, because he just knew too much about something that was too dangerous to be put out in public. Um, for those of you who weren't there last night, this is a case of uh, state-sponsored terrorism. Um, it's a case of a Western intelligence agency, which was MI6, the James Bonds of the, of the world, uh, going ahead and funding our terrorist enemies, Islamic extremist terrorists in Libya, in an attempt to try and assassinate a foreign head of state. And the story runs that in 1995, a Libyan military intelligence officer walked into the Tunis embassy and asked to see the MI6 officer based there. He said that he had a ragtag group of Islamic extremist terrorists, some of whom had known links to bin Laden, who were planning to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi um, and take power in Libya. He wanted funding from, M from MI6 in order to carry out this attack. They needed money for the very basics of the coup, the explosives, the guns, the uh, jeeps, the tents even. And MI6 went ahead and did this. They gave them in the region about $120,000 to go and try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi. Now, this was an incredibly reckless thing to do in a very volatile section of the world. Um, this also doesn't make sense, because Gaddafi, by this point, had renounced his support of terrorism. On the other hand, of course, Al-Qaeda, as it's become known, um, was the new big threat, as far as Western intelligence agencies were concerned. Anyway, the attack went ahead in early 1996, a bomb or grenade was put under the wrong car, part of a cavalcade that Colonel Gaddafi was driving in. And he obviously survived, but innocent people died. Not only the ones traveling in the car with the bomb, but also in the ensuing security shootout. So innocent bystanders standing there waving their Libyan flags as Gaddafi went past, died in the shootout. So these are innocent people. These are someone's family, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters. These are not collateral damage, which is what these people in the intelligence services would have us believe. The operation was also illegal under British law because MI6 didn't get permission of the Foreign Secretary, its political master. Without that permission, they are as guilty as you and I would be if we conspired to carry out murder abroad. So on a whole range of different reasons, for a whole range of different reasons, um, we were disgusted with this attack. Uh, we went ahead and left MI5 and we went public with this. Um, the initial response to the government when David brought this information to their attention through a legal channel was to have David thrown in prison in Paris with a view to extradition. And also, of course, to at all costs avoid a public inquiry into this allegation. And they managed to do that by wheeling out the then Foreign Secretary, a man called Robin Cook, who's now dead, um, to appear on a high-profile political show in the UK called Breakfast with Frost on a Sunday morning. This was the day after, well, this is the, sorry, the week after the story appeared in the national press. Cook had had no time to conduct a proper inquiry, but he went on the show and categorically denied anything that MI6 had anything to do with it. He said that uh, there was absolutely no basis in fact to Shayla's allegations, and that it was pure fantasy. Now, subsequently, other information has come out into the public realm that proves what Dave said is true. There was a leaked document from MI6 that came out in the year 2000 showing precisely the attack, precisely the plot that David had talked about. Also, information has come out via the French intelligence services, pointing to the fact um, that there was a man called Abdullah Radwan, who was the person, the Libyan military intelligence officer, 
who went ahead and carried out this attack. He's subsequently been killed. Um, so this is manifestly not pure fantasy. But to this day, the Foreign Office will say it still is. And they expect to be able to get away with it. And of course, with the current form of government in the UK, they can. There is still no public inquiry. And now running through that very rapidly, um, and also sort of, there are a number of other cases of state-sponsored false flag terrorism that we saw, both in Northern Ireland, where MI5 employed agents to penetrate the IRA, um, and then allowed them to run amok, even to the extent of killing other MI5 and army agents to maintain their cover. It was completely immoral. Uh, there was also the case of, the, um, of Mossad bombing its own embassy in London in order to uh, shatter a Palestinian support network in London and to gain greater security around their embassy. So I'm just raising some of these issues really to highlight the fact that these are not um, isolated instances. Of course the intelligence services and rogue elements of the government will cover up for them. Of course the intelligence services play dirty. Um, but we expect them not, if they're going to do that, to a certain extent at least to do their job properly and protect us. And certainly in the UK, we are not offered adequate protection by MI5 and MI6, as we saw with 7-7. They play fast and loose with our lives. We're just, you know, collateral damage if we get caught up in a terrorist activity in our own countries. So this is part of a pattern. It's part of a power play on their part, and it's part of jobs for the boys. They want to ensure that there is always a state of perpetual warfare. This is Orwellian, the Orwellian nightmare. They want to ensure that there is always an enemy to fight so that they can get resources, so that they can have jobs for the boys and keep the arms industry in business. And that's the real plan behind all these things. So um, with that background in mind, I'd like to pass over to Ian, who's going to say a few words about the similarities behind the modus operandi of all these attacks. Thank you very much.